Simon, would you start the questions, please? Okay, well, I, I have... I can, I'm, am I only allowed to ask one question, or can I ask a couple? Well, we'll see how good the first question is. Okay, so between the two of us. If that was the case, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Horton about the look at his study. So up to the results, obviously, it's a beautifully done study. It's a lot of work, a lot of resources devoted to it. But is the result really uh, uh, can be used to answer the original hypothesis that you designed as, uh, the trial for? Yeah. Well, uh, this is a really very good question. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that the, to me, the way I just personally look at it, the lifestyle program was very effective in keeping the rate of cardiovascular events low. The control group um, also decreased their event rate very significantly, so there was no difference between the two groups. But they were actually uh, getting uh, medications. Uh, they, they were, uh, so their, their lipids were better controlled. They were, they were more statin use, more blood pressure control. So I think that, to me, you, it just shows there's more than one pathway to get there. Uh, it doesn't mean that the lifestyle program was ineffective. It means that uh, you you can, uh, uh, I think we're generally much more aware now in, in our general population, but also our diabetic population, of the importance of, of um, really treating all the risk factors for cardiovascular disease aggressively and early. The other point I get across from this, I, I've been involved in the diabetes prevention program as well, uh, and I think that the, er, you have, the other lesson I learned from this is you have to start early. You know, I think we should be identifying people at high risk for diabetes, people with metabolic syndrome, uh, and that's where we have the greatest opportunity to really impact on the long-term outcomes. Because the patients in the Look Ahead trial were really much farther down the pathway. They're, they're older, they were 59 years old, they're, they're now, uh, you know, in their late 60s or early 70s, uh, and uh, I think we're just starting too late. I mean, we know that the whole process for cardiovascular disease starts very early, even before diabetes. So two messages. One is there's more than one way to skin a cat, but if we're going to skin the cat, we better get it early when it's just a kitten. <laughs> I think Michael wants to make a comment. Yeah, I mean, I represent the cardiovascular community. We've spent most of our time focusing on these patients with very advanced coronary disease and looking at forms of revascularization that may be optimal. And I would echo what Dr. Horton says, that when the, in these patients, the effects of blood pressure lowering, glycemic control, LDL even, are different than they are in patients who are younger. So there's a lot of, it's a heterogeneous population. So I think the duration of diabetes and the advanced and the degree of advancement of coronary disease are playing a role here. So that maybe these interventions of lifestyle are more suited to the pre-diabetic patient or the patients who are younger diabetics. So the first one was pretty good, so you get a second. Very good answer, Dr. Horton, but what I was trying to yeah. get at is actually trying to challenge uh, all of us to think about the different paradigms mm -hmm. uh, uh, of therapeutic uh, randomized trial from a pharmaceutical paradigm of thinking versus the thinking of uh, a nutritional or dietary intervention trial. Mm -hmm. like based on the pre-med uh, study, as well as the other successful study. I've been involved in the Women's Health Initiative, mm -hmm. and, and, and over the 20-some years yeah. of the trial, we know how difficult it is for to do those trials. You are essentially changing uh, uh, people's uh, com sort of like complete way of life, uh, right. uh, as, uh, uh, so to speak. And then uh, compliance is a major issue. Mm -hmm. So in the name of a, a randomized control intervention trial, but what you're getting in practice, it is a observational study, mm -hmm. it is almost. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's one thing. Uh, the, the way the thinking in terms of thinking along the line of yep. using one particular drug uh, uh, for the participant to accept it, 
or not, it is very different from uh, a way of life to sort of one have to engage in. Yeah, well, I, yes, you're bringing up a very important point, and, and, uh, and Herzl, I'm sure, wants to make a comment on this too, because we have used randomized controlled trials as kind of the gold standard for our trials, and, and we do this in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's, it's uh, clear. But when it gets into lifestyle modifications, um, I really, that's why I made the comment, it was just my own personal comment, and nobody else that I've talked to in our group has really talked about this before, is how do you take the results of a randomized controlled trial and translate it to the general population? And that's what, you know, I mean, the women's health study is, is perfect, and the physician's health study. You know, I, I talk with Joanne quite, quite frequently about all this. I mean, we need those kinds of data, too. I mean, that's, that's real life, right? So randomized controlled trials, while they're scientifically important, can't necessarily be translated totally to real life. I don't know, what do you want to say? So I, I'm going to have a slightly different spin on this, okay? So um, I, first of all, it's important to remember that a, a randomized controlled trial is a prospective study and you can analyze the results from a randomized controlled trial as if it were an observational study if you ignore the randomization. So you still have a cohort of X number of people that have been followed X period of time. And so it's wonderful. So, all, so, so you can use the findings you get in a randomized controlled trial in order to do all sorts of hypothesis generating and all test a whole bunch of ideas and do all sorts of really interesting analysis that will drive other good research down the line. However, however, you do randomized controlled trials are crucial. You cannot, and if you don't get the result that you expect to find, it doesn't mean that the randomized controlled trial is wrong, and it doesn't mean that you need to explain away the randomized controlled trial. So, like with respect to my, my friend Ed here, um, you can't argue it both ways. You can't say, look, the DPP shows that you can prevent diabetes with diet and exercise, therefore we all have to do diet and exercise, but the look ahead show doesn't show it, therefore we should still all do diet and exercise. No, in, in fact, the DPP shows that diet and exercise in a randomized controlled trial is strong, really strong evidence that modest modifications to your lifestyle will prevent diabetes. What the look ahead trial shows is that you have a, and the DPP trial also had a group of very motivated people. So in the look ahead trial, you have, if you have a group of motivated people, an aggressive lifestyle intervention is not going to reduce your cardiovascular event rate differently than usual approaches in the United States and Canada and some European countries of, of, of aggressive uh, intervention on risk factors and lipids and blood pressures and everything else. I think the inference is that, uh, and I think a fair inference from look ahead, is you can do it with lifestyle or you can do it with drugs. With respect to cardiovascular events, you're going to get the same finding. That is, and, and that, I think, is a perfectly good interpretation of the randomized controlled trial. What, what, what Ed also talked about is that there were other, other outcomes measured that were not pre-specified as primary outcomes, but they were pre-specified as outcomes of interest, other outcomes. One thing, for instance, was diabetes remission. 11% of people in the look-ahead trial went into diabetes. These are well-established diabetes. Their diabetes went away. And in fact, even at, at one year, and even at four years, 4% 4 of those people still had their diabetes went away versus a lot lower in, in, in the control group. That, in fact, is an example of there's reduced exposure to disc glycemia. That may very well, that plus the lower A1C may very well explain the renal effect. Now, if this was a drug study for FDA, you could not say we've proved it because the primary outcome was not significant, and therefore you could say that all the other analyses are hypothesis generating. Great. Research is not a yes or no answer. You know, a randomized control trial is just an experiment, except it's a really expensive experiment. And, and, and the trouble is, if it was a bunch of mice, you can do it 20 times, and you can replicate it, and you can do it. In humans, you can do it two times, three times, four times. But it doesn't mean you don't learn from it. You know, and so I, I, think, I think we actually are agreeing with each other very much, and, and I, but I, I would say it's not to, you don't dismiss or you don't say that the methodology is bad because you don't like the results. I mean, the results are the results, and you go forward and say, what can we learn from this to do other research? What can we learn from it? I, I agree. Andreas, please. Uh, Andreas Pfeiffer from Berlin in Germany. And I have an important, well, an interesting question to you. Uh, when we present the data from the Look Ahead study, which is really a great study and very interesting, you still have two components in there. One is the food and one is the physical activity. 
And this funny graph there, kind of which stops after four years, is something from which I conclude that you cannot get people to do physical activity. You told us otherwise now. But so, and the second point is, was the diet the wrong diet? But uh, the, I think, is that conclusion correct? Why, why did you stop showing the physical activity data after four years? And did you really get a difference because what the cardiologists see, even in very advanced coronary disease, is actually if you put people to physical exercise, you can greatly reduce event rates even without further intervention. There are a couple yeah. of nice studies. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, the, the physical activity component of it obviously is really important. And, and we do have questionnaire data you know, that we've collected on the, on the patients because it all is really self-report from the from questionnaires. Uh, and uh, I haven't, I know we've got those data all the way out. I don't think they've been fully analyzed. In the early part of the study, uh, we did an analysis to see if we could sort out how much of the uh, impact was, could you explain, by weight reduction and how much of it by physical activity. And it came out that the strongest predictor was the weight loss. But to me, I've also, I'm, I'm a great believer in physical activity, as you probably know. And uh, um, I think part of that is it's much easier to measure weight <laughs> than it is physical activity. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, so, th so the physical activity component, uh, you know, we didn't do VO2 maxes on, well, we did, we did submaximal testing uh, a couple of times, but we didn't do VO2. We did a VO2 max in the beginning, uh, mostly uh, as a, Safety issue. We wanted because we didn't. We we actually did not randomize people uh, if uh, they couldn't meet certain criteria by doing a VO2 max. So the exercise component of it still needs to be analyzed in more detail. And you're right. The focus has been mostly on the weight side of the equation. But I think the exercise is very important. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, but the, 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 for Sorry. me, one. Go Sorry, Jordan. Don't please. Yes. Um, for me, one of the problems is to, that the look ahead has been focused on losing weight. Mm -hmm. And there are mm -hmm. several types of, uh, of uh, possibilities of losing weight. Uh, I have talked about diet, but also physical activity uh, needs to be uh, rethinking. Um, because uh, if you if you say if if you sh uh, in in the slide that you have the, the 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 curve of weight loss, you can see that after five years, it it has an, a decrease in the weight in both groups. Mm -hmm. What is the result of this? Is is sarcopenia? Yeah. For, yeah. Perhaps the intervention induces sarcopenia. And losing weight is not good because of this. Mm. And probably there are other uh, possible uh, interventions that uh, sarcopenia are prevented, will be, will be prevented. What do you think about this? No, I, 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 I agree with you completely. Uh, you know, I... We, we have a ton of data coming out of the of the uh, uh, look ahead study, and I wasn't able to even scratch the surface in showing you things. But we do have sub studies looking at body composition, uh, and uh, there's no question in this population, which was act actually they were 59 years old at randomization, and we're now 10 years, 12 yeah. years down. So they're you know they're they're uh, 70 uh, is the average age. Some people are older than that, and we are getting into the problem problems of aging in a diabetic population. And this study really now gives us the opportunity to look at some of the issues of aging. And uh, the sarcopenia of aging is very, very important uh, um, uh, issue. Uh, David and David and I were talking about how much trouble we're having uh, walking up the stairs now. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so so I, I have a personal interest in this. <laughs> well, well, once once you get up into into uh, uh, you know over the age of eighty, you begin to uh, realize that sarcopenia is a is a significant factor in your life. Velomir, <laughs> uh, please. Thank you, George, really for very. A nice project. I am from the Italian country. We are really looking for your results. But my question is: Did you uh, uh, did you 
it did you take also population for rural area because the participant. Mm -hmm. I think there will be a different between the citizen uh, from citizen from city than some from rural. Because in rural area, especially in material area, near the sea, these people know what is material diet, the practices diet, because uh, it's not, uh, there is really no problem with uh, economic status of these patients. You could produce oil, oil produce the, uh, taking the fish yourself sometimes. Especially these, these people practice a lot of physical activity for daily job. I think later we will analyze this uh, data. We think very important we made some sample for analyzing the uh, degree of uh, physical activity and also special, really they implemented this diet if there's some citizen who must pay everything. And also yes. the problem for Canadian, how is uh, implemented uh, Mediterranean diet in Canada, especially in United States, right? Well, we can test this, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriele? Gabriele Riccardi from Naples, <coughs> Italy. I have a question for Jordi. Uh, there are two important features of science. One is uh, general, generalability, and the other one is reproducibility. Well, I often quote the, the pre-med study in my talks in Italy and uh, elsewhere, but I always get the, the question from, from the audience, okay, but what the Mediterranean diet is? Mm -hmm. Now, you, you define Mediterranean diet on, on the basis of, of 17 parameters that you have in your uh, I think that uh, is useful to uh, interpret the data and to, to, to make the trial, but it, it is a bit difficult then to translate into clinical practice and say to the, the patient or to, to healthy people what they really should do. So my question is, on the basis of the first predimet study, are you not able to identify within these 17 features three or four which really matter, which really make the difference between the control and the intervention group, so that in the new, in the PREDIMED Plus, you can concentrate mostly on these four, five features which really make the difference. Because otherwise, we, we get the impression that, okay, the Mediterranean diet works, uh, I know that it works, uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the result, but then it becomes difficult to translate this for Canadian people or for people in China or for people elsewhere in the world. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting question. Uh, the generality is one of the limitations of the clinical trials in general, no? and uh, this need to be resolved with other studies, I suppose. Uh, I think uh, these changes are easy to be implemented. In the PREDIMED 1 study, we have used as a tool a 40-point questionnaire with 40 items. And the editions try to scale in these recommendations, in these 40 items. So uh, if you measure in one individual the score, you have nine points. The dietitians focus in the rest of the points in order to increase, to scale in the Mediterranean diet score. I think uh, is is a easy tool in order to increase the adherence to the Mediterranean diet in terms of public health problem, uh, pu public health. Um, I don't know, I think uh, the, 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 what are the, the, the changes responsible of the beneficial effects in terms of cardiovascular disease and mortality in the PREDIMED one, it is very difficult to explore this. Probably is uh, the reflect of little changes that we have conducted and we have arrived <laughs> because in this 40 point score, we have observed di di uh, differences in changes between groups in 11 of these 14 points. So uh, I think the results of the, in terms of the prevention of cardiovascular disease is the, that we have changed the overall food pattern, not a lot, but with several uh, little changes. 
and also especially for uh, the nuts that we give for free to the participants and the olive oil that we give for free to the participants. And, but nuts and olive oil probably are... Um, uh, and, um, is a tool is a tool in order to increase the adherence because uh, people come uh, to the consultation in order to have the olive oil and three nuts. And in this occasion, the dietitian have time to change the overall food pattern. She has another occasion to to change and to scale in this Mediterranean diet. So okay. I think I think at the end is the changing the, 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 the food pattern, what is important in order to, to, to achieve and to, to, to have this reduction in the, in the terms of cardiovascular disease and mortality. Okay, we're going to have one last question from Jenny Brand Miller. Short question and very short answer, please. Okay, Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. My question is for Dr. Gerstein. I apologize if I haven't <coughs> pronounced it Perfect. correctly. Oh, that's good. Um, I know you don't like metadata. So my question is, but you do like large randomized control trials, so my question is, would there be anything gained from combining all the data, say from look ahead with PREDIMED, and teasing out um, what dietary factors, what nutritional patterns uh, are associated with not only the best outcomes clinically, but the most enjoyment of food and life? Yeah. So I, let me just make one comment. Actually, I don't dislike any research. All research is wonderful. It, it's just that I, what, I, what I object to is using a methodology which is not appropriate for making inferences about causality for, or about uh, therapy for therapy, and then it's ascribing 100% um, confidence to that methodology and ignoring the appropriate methodology. So I, I, I object to misinterpreting the research. I mean, I think, Mice research is fantastic, but to do a mouse study and say you must do this in humans is, is an inappropriate interpretation of the mouse study. So, so, I, so I think what you've said is perfectly reasonable. You, you know, but the, the point of, of, but it's not going to prove the answer. What it's going to do, uh, if you were to do analyses um, of multiple trials that use nutritional interventions, not just the PREDIMED trial, but there are many trials where the outcome wasn't cardiovascular events, but were diabetes prevention. There are about 10 different diabetes prevention trials, about 12. Many of them use the nutritional interventions as part of them, and, and you know, the Finnish trial, the American trial, the Indian trial, et cetera, and, and there's look ahead, and there's, there's, there's other, and one needs to look at these results, not ignore them, look at them and say, what are we learning from them to help design the next trial? And the next trial, I mean, the PREDIMED people are doing that to design the second trial that they talked about, but I I agree. Now, you're saying doing it in a systematic way, great. It's hard to do that, but I think if you can do that, that's really good too. So you don't think you, you can combine them and say there were three or three groups, a control no, I, group, a I, low factor? I think that would be hypothesis, hypothesis generating at best. You know, you, you could look at it, but you're not going to come to a definitive answer that would give you any confidence in, in, in recommending it in a, at a global or a public health approach. I think we better end the session now. I'd like to thank the uh, speakers and the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.